Khan couldn't have begun in a more lavish way. It always does, but in this particular year, Princess Grace was going to be the person overseeing the ceremony, the opening ceremony, and it was going to be with this restoration of Gone with the Wind. A huge tribute to Hollywood and to the glory of the movies as they used to be. It's a huge night because it's a long film and there's fireworks. That turns out to be the very date that uh, the barricades went up in Paris, the Night of the Barricades, as it's called. Eight days later, we have the very famous scene of Godard and Truffaut, flanked by Geraldine Chaplin and Carlos Sora, holding onto the curtain, trying to stop films from being shown. The festival was closed the next day. So what happened in between there? Well, uh, quite a lot happened. 1968, the most special con of all, because it's the year in which no Palme d'Or was given and in which cinema took on a very different sort of role and different function from anything it had had before. The new wave had its big burst, late 58 to 63, let's say, and most people think that it's pretty much died down the formal experimentation and all the new directors are finished by 63. Then comes the more ideological left, and the new wave has ambitions not only for the form of cinema, but for actually allowing cinema to have a social effect. Truffaut and Godard, they thought that cinema would help push France and maybe the world to the left. All around the world there were new waves, and things were loosening up in Czechoslovakia, Eastern Europe. And then there's the Henri Langlois affair that begins mid-February of 68, when André Malraux, the Minister of Culture, forces him out. So he thought it would be an easy thing to do, but the entire new wave got behind Langlois. They grew up with him, and he's one of the great, magnificent people in the history of cinema. So they said they would never allow their films to be shown at the Cinematheque again, and they called all their friends in the U.S. and Russia and everywhere else, and many, many, many telegrams came in from Orson Welles, from Chaplin, saying that was it. They, they couldn't imagine what, what was going on in France. On February 16th, Truffaut wrote a blistering editorial against Melrose. At the end of it, he said, I want everybody that cares about the cinema to meet on February 16th at the Palais de Chaillot, where they had just opened up the new Cinematheque at six o'clock. And a lot of people heeded the call and came there. But what greeted them were the police. And it was quite a standoff. Godard had somehow managed to get through the cordon and it joined Truffaut and uh, Bertrand Tavernier. And they were on the steps, uh, screaming to the crowd and trying to keep them from dispersing. There was a charge of the police, and the result was that both Truffaut and Godard had slight injuries, as it's always reported, and Tavernier was quite bloodied. And it was a failure in a way. The crowd was dispersed, but it was a moral victory. This was the beginning, the first real bloody incident that was going to then produce uh, May 68 incidents. After the Langlois affair, we've got several things that occur. First of all, in April, Philippe Garrel wins the Young Cinema Award at uh, Hier, which is pretty close to Cannes. And receiving that award, he says, I don't think we should care that much about cinema. We should be with the factory workers. And I wish this film could be turned into a cobblestone so I could throw it. You know, he was only two weeks early, because <laughs> uh, that's exactly what would happen. There would be some other ones. The students began to occupy the classrooms at Nanterre. It was a university confrontation at the Sorbonne, and that's when things really got going. And it took a couple of days for things to boil over until May 10th, and you had the Night of the Barricades. In a couple of days, things really escalated to violence, and then to the great general strike of May 18th, when everything shut down. The planes, the trains, the metro, the newspapers, all the movie theaters. And that's when the Cannes Film Festival curtain was torn. There was uh, just low level of interest in the movies. And in fact, the selection that year is not particularly exciting. So they were waiting for something to stir the events. And actually, they were waiting for the Milos Forman film, Fireman's Ball, and then followed by Peppermint Frappe, which was Carlos Sora's film, which he had just made with Geraldine Chaplin, whom he had gotten together with. Everybody thought it was going to be the usual con on the beach. Monica Vitti even showed off her excitement that Antonioni supposedly had just proposed to her. Sharon Tate and Polanski were arm in arm, but word kept coming down from Paris that things were different up there. And it was really the film critics, a couple of critics that were calling in and saying, you're not getting the right story. 
They realized that they were missing the big event of the decade. And Godard even said that we're eight days behind our, our brothers in Paris. We should be up there working with them. And that's when Godard and Truffaut said, we should shut this festival down. It's uh, grotesque to have it underway. Peppermint Frappe was supposed to have its critics screening in the morning in a smaller theater, the Jean Cocteau Theater. Truffaut grabbed the mic and said, and at one point, Godard began to scream, I demand that the jury come here. And Polanski said, I've heard demands like this before. I've lived through Stalinism. And he turned to Milos Forman, who was there, and he said, we know about this, don't we, Milos? And Godard says, are you for us or against us? And they got in a screaming match. And the, by this time, the little theater had filled to overflowing, and they were afraid of something happening. So they moved it to the Grand Palace. And uh, that's when the jury did come and said, we're quitting. So when the jury members, Monica Vitti and Polanski, uh, retired, they quit. It was a, uh, a major defeat for the festival. Only 11 of the films of the 26 were actually screened at all because the festival was canceled before the others could be shown. So it was a quieter film event, but a very large uh, political event that I think was dominated by this dramatic scene on May 18th. It's a moment of celebration in which there needs to be, through confrontation also, some inhibitions. So you have to stop things from happening as well as start them. So yeah, I think it's a very interesting situation where the refusal to show a film becomes maybe even the best promotion of the film. The Cannes Film Festival was quite changed by this event. Starting the next year, and in years subsequent, we have the Quinzaine de la Réalisateur, and we have a couple of parallel groups of films that are put on by the festival to the side of it to allow new voices, films that would not necessarily make it at the market and maybe not even please the large crowds that come to Cannes for the festival, but that the festival itself decided needed to help advance the cause of cinema altogether. 68 didn't belong only to the French, and they knew it. They were following what was going on at Columbia, at Berkeley, and in other parts of the world. Curiously, it's not so curious, it's actually kind of dramatically, Milos Forman, on May 19th, was trying to get a ticket to go back to Prague, but decided to go up because he was still trying to get money for his new film to Paris. And when he got up there, he was staying with Lelouch and stayed there for a month and a half uh, working to get funds. Well, the tanks rolled into Prague in August and he was gonna race back to get his family, but he was terrified of going there. Lelouch said, don't move. And Lelouch actually flew with his own French passport to Prague, managed to get his family out and Forma never really went back even. And he had his career in the US. So the East European group of filmmakers moved west, and Cannes could be considered a turning point for them as well. You can see that everything is turning. The whole history of French cinema is kind of turning toward a new point of political possibility, and cinema is going to be right there to lead it. Films are collective events that you can only see them in groups, and everybody knew this. This is a place where you could actually have discussions and you could begin to foment new possibilities, and cinema gives you the imaginary. It allows you to think of celebrating new collectivities as a collective yourself. So it's, uh, it was a perfect, perfect place for things to occur. When everyone returned from Cannes on May 19th, uh, there was a decision made to bring together all sectors of cinema around what's called the Estates General, which is a reference to the 1789 Estates General that started the revolution. Technicians, studio heads, critics, editors of Cahiers, and the film students got together to figure out how they should operate in the future. And there they made a series of resolutions, I think there were 26 of them all together, about how cinema should operate. There was a ban on censorship, there was going to be new ways in which film distribution could occur, they wanted filmmakers to be part of the film distribution. It permanently changed the way the intellectual field looked, in France at least, and because of that, we all had a very different look at cinema after 68 at Cannes.